Oh, good morning. Can you guys hear? I think so. Yeah. How about me? Yes. Okay. Uh, like, like Jason said, uh, I'm Jeff Rogers. Uh, this is Dima. We've been with Groupon for about a year and a half for me. About yeah, about the same for me. We both uh, came over from ThoughtWorks, which you guys have probably heard of. Uh, I was there for about 12 years. And I was there only about two years. And actually, this talk here, um, ever since I met Jeff, he's been talking about this topic for like ages and ages. And he kept on mentioning it about this idea, this great idea he has that will change the world. But any time I would ask him, well, why don't you write up a blog post about it? Well, OK, I'm working on it. So kind of a couple of months ago, I kind of didn't tell him and submit the talk idea and kind of forced them into this. But now that you and your wife are here in no. this beautiful city, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll start. So the idea, the, the title of the, the talk is Pluggable Test Infrastructures. Uh, I put an asterisk by Pluggable because I've been searching for months to find a better, more interesting name than that. Uh, Pluggable really is what it means. It's we we means we have we at runtime we can plug in different test implementations as we run our tests. Surprisingly, I have a creative art background, but I cannot think of anything fun, techy, to call this. So, as you guys watch this, if you come up with any ideas, we have, here are you can get us here or just holler them out at the end. Uh, so to start with, just to give you a high high level, it's like I said, uh, in a pluggable test infrastructure, the behavior. Uh, is the authority, it's the truth, it's, it's what drives everything. And during, at runtime, we plug in different implementations for web, API, mobile, uh, could be any number of things. Uh, at one point, at a client long ago at ThoughtWorks, we had a database implementation as well. Uh, before we go too much into that, um, I'll talk to you guys a little bit about Groupon. I don't know if you, you've probably heard the name, a um, little bit about what we do. Uh, the idea is we provide discounted daily, local, timely, relevant deals to users, uh, users and customers. The, um, the general, the first idea was kind of this group buying thing, so group coupon is sort of where the name came from. It's so basically a deal would be offered at a, a significantly high discount if you brought along 20 of your friends to buy it with you, and so that idea just kind of took off. And, we are where we are today. Uh, we run about 1,000 deals or more per day in the US. Uh, there's about 33 million um, active customers in the US. And worldwide, there's about 11,000 employees. Um, I asked for a number of global engineering roles. Nobody responded to my email, so I can't tell you exactly how many developers, QA, uh, we have. Uh, the site and the application in general is mostly Rails. There's a little bit of Java on the back end. There's some other stuff that doesn't don't really, isn't really pertinent, so I won't go into that. Uh, for testing the website, we are primarily use Cucumber, Capybara, WebDriver. We use RSpec for integration and unit testing. Um, and like I said about engineering, we're actually kind of all over the place, so if you're interested, um, please reach out. Uh, our main dev center is in Chicago and Palo Alto. It's roughly split. Uh, number-wise, but we also have a small office in Berlin, or sorry, a small office in Seattle, a large office in Berlin where our international operations are run from, and we also now have a Washington, D.C. office, which That's is me. part of I am one. my own office. It's great. Yes. Um, so backtracking a little bit about some of the history of where we are and why a pluggable infrastructure can, can help with the situation we're in. Backtrack. Uh, a couple years ago, two and a half years ago or so, Groupon was a small sort of startup uh, Rails app. Uh, it was a small monolith. That's supposed to be a monolith. I don't know if you guys, that comes out in that. Uh, this is sort of a, how a lot of Rails projects will start up, where you basically have everything that you need, uh, every access to every model, uh, database, everything you need can be uh, right here, like on my laptop to, to work on. Uh, the, the idea got popular, so our product owners and our executives started throwing, throw, throwing more and more feature uh, requests at us. So over the next, say, two and a half so years, this became quite large. Um, the interesting thing from a testing background is, yeah, it's slow. Uh, it's brittle. It can be confusing at times, but it is insanely easy to test something like that. Functional tests. Is Probably a better way to say that. So, just like I said, I can pull all the code down. I can start the server. I literally have everything on my laptop that I could ever need. Uh, that is, uh, I could be exactly what production has, except for production data, of course. But uh, 
So I, I, I don't have to worry about a service version over here or a multiple databases over there. I basically have everything. Um, so that was what I, when I say easy to test, that's what I mean. I don't have to uh, make sure that I'm running the head version of some service over here or the version from three months ago uh, for a different service over there. Now, while that sounds exciting from, from my point of view, uh, the website started to get popular and that is really not the best model to have for a popular website. Uh, I can tell you guys some stories over beers about the website basically melting, uh, but we won't go into that because, so we, we kind of went under an initiative uh, through this time, so kind of between here and here to SOASI everything or serviceify everything. Uh, and so here's a picture of everything sort of, I don't know if that's a great picture, but basically we've pulled out there's more than four services, but I'm trying to be simplistic here. Uh, we've pulled out all of these things to uh, different, different technology stacks, different databases, kind of all over the place internationally now. Um, so from, my, from where I sit, that is an uh, extreme pain in the ass. Like I said, I need to constantly work with our teams in Palo Alto and Chile and Brazil to find out and make sure we're running the exact right versions of things. Um, so pluggable test infrastructure comes along as a possible solution to, to do this. So I, want to, I want to be very clear before I start really going into this that um, what, we're, what we're suggesting here, what we're proposing is not really flipping the idea of like unit integration and functional testing on its ear or anything like that. We're kind of providing a interesting way to do end-to-end -end testing. We, have, uh, we still have 17,000 unit tests, I think. Yeah. Something like, that. Something like that. So we have 17,000 unit tests, a couple thousand uh, integration tests, and about 1,000 or 1,500 functional tests. So what we're, what we're uh, suggesting here is more of like a bolt-on way to make sure that at the end of the day, all of our stuff is hanging together as we expect it to be. So this is kind of in my consulting days, uh, even in the early days of Groupon, this is sort of your typical setup. You have, you have a website, you have an API. That's our official API logo. I'm not sure what it means. We have a thing for kittens, um, and you know our, your iPhone app. So typically, you have three different test assets. They may live in different repos. Uh, the other problem here, uh, you could potentially have different behaviors described depending on who's writing the test, which is where we have a lot of problems uh, and confusion about what these things actually do. And these tests are extremely tied to the implementation. So you have a lot of clicks. You have a lot of press this, tap that, uh, very, very tied to this is just a web page. I can only run this test against a web page, or I can only run this test against the API, which is sort of anti pluggable, if, if that makes sense. So the pluggable idea is basically we have, like I said earlier, uh, the behavior is the gospel here, it's the truth. So we write our, these tests in given when then, English or sorry, just a common language that everyone understands. You still have to implement three different uh, tests, sorry, three different implementations of talking to your web page, talking to your API, and talking to your mobile. Uh, we also have an, this is also simplistic because we have an Android stuff too. We have a- uh, Windows 7 stuff and- Sauce, yeah. Two mobile sites. Two mobile sites, yeah, yeah, yeah. So didn't want to get too confused here. Um, so here we have <coughs> just one test of behavior. So think, for example, a really easy one. Like one, of the, one of the big things that we do, obviously, is sell things. So you want to make sure that never breaks. So if I go to Groupon, I log in, I can buy this thing. I should see that in my list of my order history. Now that's something that you can say for a mobile example. You can say for an API example. You can say for a web. Uh, but, this, but the important part is this is not tied to implementation. So we, we've removed all sort of clicking on things or I should see a pop-up to more general uh, high-level statements like I am notified or I choose to purchase. Here's another example. I don't know if you want to get Basically, I'm viewing the feature deal for San Francisco when I choose to purchase this and I provide my billing details. Then I should be informed that purchase was successful and you should see my purchase in my Groupons. If you look at that closely, there's, there's very little... Um, technical detail of how that test, it's more of a high level, you know, sort of the real reason Cucumber was put in place to have that conversation with our product people about these are the features we want to support. And 
On the back end, which Dima will get into a little bit, um, we have multiple step definitions or step definition folders that at runtime we can tell it which, one of the, which kind of test this is. So if it's an iPhone test, it'll only load this directory and it'll only uh, use those drivers. So like I said, natural common language, no click type press. Um, another great benefit of this is pipelining by fastest to slowest. So obviously if you're going to run just the API test, it's going to go a whole lot faster. So the example that we're going to run here, I ran it this morning and it was just about 0.8 seconds. Uh, Selenium was more and then Sauce was marked to much more browsers. Now, what you can do with your API test, for example, is uh, you can give them to your developers to sort of pre-commit. Developers like running tests before they push something to CI. Uh, they know that if they broke something really critical at this point. And then say the API test works, the Selenium test fails, you can probably reasonably guess that there's something wrong with your UI code in that example. Um, so anything you want to go on before you, before you talk? Okay, okay. Right. so um, now that Jeff has sold the basic idea, I want to go in some of the more technical details. Uh, one of the first things you really, really want to avoid is the conditional situation where uh, if, if you're going against the iPhone or the mobile site or the uh, regular site and you want to click on the purchase button, having a um, conditional saying, hey, this is a regular website, so we're testing against the regular website, so the purchase button will look like this, you click on this element, but else if it's a, some sort of a mobile website, the button is a little bit differently. And um, especially this is true when you have a lot of feature flagging. Anybody here uses feature flags? Just, oh, wow. Whew. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, the, uh, the projects that Jeff and I were on, the, we used a lot of feature flagging to basically uh, do some A-B testing and hide some of the behavior depending on the customer and trying to figure out what is the best flow. And so the purchase flow would be affected dramatically depending on which feature was on. And sometimes you would have two or three features that would just, uh, when they're turned on together, they would change the flow even further together. But we needed to have a end-to-end um, -end test for every single combination of the features, or at least some sort of a reasonable thing. And uh, in the beginning, we started to put in, hey, if this <coughs> feature one is on, well, that means that the header is a little bit different or the, the, uh, the form for the purchase form on the page object is a little bit different, so let's account for that. And it got out of hand really, really quickly where you would have thousands of the ifs, thens, and then as soon as that feature is either merged into the master or kicked out, then you have to go and retroactively pull out dozens of uh, these code snippets that really trash up your code base. So the idea of trying to figure out, okay, I'm in this environment right now, the button should look this way, is not necessarily good. What seems to be working pretty well is in the beginning, before the test run, you load up the, uh, uh, the files that describe the flow of the application. So if you're going through the mobile site, you just go into the, well, we call it touch site, but you go and you, uh, load all of the step definition files from the touch folder and uh, being good programmers you will dump all the common stuff into the comment folder so we're running the iPhone test okay here this only fits for the iPhone so don't worry about it um, which sort of leads into the next thing of uh, why we use cucumber uh, you don't have to use cucumber uh, it seems to be a lot of people either absolutely love it or absolutely hate it and uh, maybe Cucumber is not the right choice for you, maybe you should go choose whatever you want, but one of the nice features that it gives you from uh, the get-go is the support for profiles. And you can say, hey, I'm going to run this set of tests with the iPhone profile or with the mobile profile, and it's really easy to say, okay, when it's uh, API profile, load up the stuff that's in the API folder, or lo you can load up multiple folders at the same time and you don't have to individually load one file at a time you just kind of says here load everything in this folder so it kind of helps the other reason that I like Cucumber is that it will probably support your uh, platform whether you're using Perl, Java, PHP or whatever uh, Cucumber will support it 
and uh, you, you will support probably your language if you want to run it in Chinese or German. It will kind of gives you abilities so that the, uh, the people's native language is used so not everything is in English. So that is one of the reasons I'm using Cucumber, but again, your choice. Yeah, it's, um, Cucumber is a pretty controversial topic within our own company too, so uh, you don't, definitely don't have to use that. It's, it makes it easier if you use a Gherkin-like uh, tool for Java, like JBehave, that's, that kind of stuff. But you don't necessarily have to. I mean, we, ha we have some implementations that are in our spec. You just have to know how to read the code uh, or how to, you can't really show our spec stuff to the product owners like we like to. But uh, yeah. you'd kind of have to roll your own to support something like this. Yeah, but the idea, though, is you load up all the test files in the beginning of the test run, and you do not try to figure out on the go what button I'm supposed to click. It just kind of is there ready for you. Uh, so I put together a small Ruby Cucumber Rake presentation. I threw it on the uh, GitHub, and I really want to run it real fast. Oof. Great. So um, if you do rake minus T, you will find out that uh, there's you can individually run different part of the website. Increasing the size. Uh, and uh, by default, the rake will try to run them all in order from uh, fastest to slowest. So we'll start off with the API, and then uh, it seems that the touch, since the touch, the mobile site is a little bit smaller, it tends to run a little bit faster compared to the regular Selenium suite. iPhone application is really slow to load. It's a lot of resources, and you can only run one test at a time because the iPhone simulator can only support one instance at a time. And then uh, uh, Sauce is just the amount of round trip and you would have to do, especially if you're using, uh, if you're running it against your local machine, just the, all of the SSH tunnels and all that stuff, it just takes a little bit longer to run. But if you were to run the API by itself, it's literally done before you know it. And it's great to just fail almost as soon as the, uh, somebody commits. You fail, you give them a red flag and you just don't go any further. That way they have a chance to go and fix it. And uh, one of our, um, initial uh, design ideas for the site was to have all of the um, all of the services and all of the the website the front end that you see it actually talks to the API so if the API is the engine of our thing and you get the API that runs really fast and it breaks you know that you broke something really serious in the application and let's let's run it all so API was already done. We're running the regular website. It's just one test. Come take a look at the San Francisco division. Make sure that things are there when they are. Move on to the next test. OK, this is our mobile website. And I actually inserted a couple of sleeps in there because it was, it was um, the test would finish and just go off before. So it kind of slows down on purpose. But yeah, by the way, whoever, the guys who did the iPhone web driver, guys, I, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, wow. Uh, hey, there's cats. Uh, and then you have the little um, sauce starting up in here. To, and the, the final step, since uh, we do not really, a lot of the developers do not really own Windows machines in our company, which is kind of weird, but uh, we kind of have to use Sauce to test Internet Explorer and just not be happy that we don't have to use Windows boxes uh, in your local environments. Yeah. So. <coughs> All right, we're almost done here before we can get to questions or uh, anything like that. Um, it's important to talk about when this is a good idea and when this isn't a good idea. Uh, so for us, uh, you know, we're a big boy company now. We're public. Um, some things breaking are a lot worse than others. So obviously that's the money path. That's obviously our subscription path, which means if I'm new, uh, how does uh, Groupon, how do I sign up and where am I attributed? Uh, so we do, we run a lot of tests uh, for those things, right? We want to make sure. Um, our API is solid. 
our web assault, our mobile assault across all of those different uh, major, major flows. I mean, we have hundreds of different types of, bill, of uh, deals that you can buy. There's Groupon Goods now, there's Getaways deal, which is like travels, travel uh, weekend deals. Um, so we want to spread that out across everything because the API, in theory, should be sort of your central thing and everything gets built on top of that. But I guess with the monolith I, so I showed earlier, the API got sort of tacked on uh, midstream there. So you can't always assume that uh, if your API works, your web's going to work, at least in our case. I think we're a lot better off now than we used to be. So uh, that's the general idea. We don't have a lot of these tests. I'd say the goal would be to have, I'd say, 50 to 60. That, and maybe not on the central, like, you saw how slow some of that is, probably not on the central uh, development loop. Yeah, but sort maybe, of a, maybe like uh, uh, post-deploy smoke test, uh, right. it would make sense because there was many times where I would finish deploying and then find out that the API is down. And it's, it's just not one of those things that you actually think of testing because it's, oh, let's do the website really fast. And then you find out that the API is down or API is doing something weird. So maybe some sort of um, smoke test that you deploy to production. Here's a sanity check of 10 tests that don't necessarily write to the database, but at least they hit the database for the reads. Yeah, the, the initial use of this uh, before I got to Groupon is I was at a client in Sydney, Australia, where um, you guys know consulting gigs. Sometimes uh, you have like one team that owns the front end, another team that owns the service layer, and another team owns the database or the back end. And I was at a client that was like this. Um, it was an insurance site that was trying to build a, a web on top of, you know, your old green screen mainframe stuff. Uh, so what we did was we implemented uh, pluggable tests at all three of those levels. We actually, someone found a, a green screen emulator that Selenium could talk to, which was actually kind of cool. Maybe that's another talk someday. Um, so you, we run those three tests to make sure that every team was being responsible or not breaking those major flows as well. So you'd run just an API test against, just to find out, hey, I didn't break anything major. We can go forward if uh, the web works. Running against the, the back end mainframe was just sort of like a, a, a final sanity check to make sure that we're not uh, regressing existing functionality. Um, when not to do this, like I said, we're not talking about flipping sort of testing methodology on its ear, really. Uh, I wouldn't replace unit tests or integration tests uh, with something like this. Uh, Cucumber does not support uh, well. Like if you want to do a lot of API testing with Cucumber, it's not the best thing to do. <laughs> really hard to add a lot of different test cases uh, that way. Um, but then also, you know, you've got features, you've likely got features, say, on a website that don't apply to the API uh, or mobile, for example. Like, you know, we have a lot of fun JavaScript-y stuff that happens on our, on our website that you wouldn't want to need to deal with an API for something like that. Uh, so the basic idea is just the core functionality that you want to support everywhere. Um, you know, Ask yourself when new features come in from, or a new uh, feature request comes in, you know, how would we implement this at the different layers of our stack and different layers of our application? Um, and some, you know, there might be a, a case where it only applies to mobile and web or it only applies to API and mobile. But the, the nice thing that Cucumber gives you, gives you here is that ability to switch in and out of different uh, directories to, to run what you want to run. Is that it? Is that the last one? And so basically, uh, I guess the, the best use case for this is uh, it's just something as a QA individual you would always have to do is just always think and protect the money path because otherwise you're not going to get paid at the end of the day. So that's the only thing that really matters. Yes. Yeah. So we went a little bit faster than we thought we would. Uh, and unfortunately, we are both needing to yeah, we, we, leave to go back. To different yeah, we're not going to be staying around for beer tonight. Yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, you can reach us there. You can holler out now, um, and we will respond quickly. Yep. We'll still be here for a couple of hours if you have some questions, but any questions now? I'll start with you. Hello. Yeah. Do you have any need to run different test cases on different environment? For example, different test cases on the sandbox or different on integration environment. And do you do you use the same kind of technique to achieve that? Uh, yeah. You. The some of the scripts that Diva has written has made that um, you can 
pass that into say a runtime parameter. Uh, the ones we run against, we run against our sandbox environments uh, at the moment, uh, but we do have the ability to point those at localhost. Yes, uh, so it's, yeah. All you, um, if you, the, that's I really like the way Rake does namespaces, where you can just say run Selenium against local or against. Uh, uh, staging or whatever, and we have one development integration environment, and then we have one major staging environment, and we're starting to actually split up into having each team have their own little integration environment so nobody steps on each other's toes. So it's uh, nice to have something like that after every single deploy to one of the team's environments to make sure that the deploy went well. So yeah. I believe you had one. Um, yeah. Uh, Assuming you, you had to get some buy-in from product management to, you know, make this work well, um, did you have any issues with that? Was it difficult to, to do or um, were they on board pretty quick? Our, um, I would say our product group is pretty enlightened. Um, maybe, maybe, okay, I'll say enlightened, but they also feel the same pain that we do in engineering. Um, you know, they, they feel the same pain of bugs, they feel the same pain of, we have a sort of too long build as it is, and then when you, when a developer says, all right, it's, in, it's gonna be here, it's gonna be, you can deploy it this afternoon, and then it goes, it runs as long as it does, and then it fails out for a reason that could have been caught on a developer's laptop, for example. Uh, that pisses them off as much as it does us. So, you know, coming from a consulting background, that was, that conversation was, 70% of my stress and pain. Uh, coming into Groupon, we've, it's, a, it's a fairly, um, I mean, it's, it, product works very closely with us. Uh, they're, they're also pretty technical. So uh, they could likely understand some of our stuff if we went to say our spec. Um, they, they do feel, they, they do sit with us, they do see these problems. Um, I foresee it being a problem, you know, now that we're, like I said, we're a big boy company now. And you know things like earnings and getting features out by the end of, end of quarters is going to be um, more important. But you know, it's not just Dima and I. Uh, our development staff is very very strong. The other thing about Groupon, which is kind of crazy, uh, back in September 2009, it was pretty much a 15 to 20 person engineering group, uh, and they got up to about 70 without hiring any QA, um, which we can talk about over another beer. Uh, but I was the, the second one that we hired. Um, I was the third. Yes, he was third. Uh, so they had to build this website that had to be, uh, it had to work. Mm -hmm. So developers wrote a lot of tests themselves. So we, we're in this environment where, like we have a lot of modals on, in our app. Um, and I've, like in past projects that I've worked on, you know, modals are historic, historically hard to talk to, like in Slam, but since they were implementing the modal and they had to implement a test to test the modal, they made that very testable. Yeah, so that, I think we've been very fortunate about it because since the developers write and maintain majority of the Selenium tests, uh, they kind of also tend to, it's, it's very easy to get buy-in from them and from a lot of the uh, project managers and those guys. But uh, the other part about it is since the developers have to do the work, they kind of make it easy on themselves and try not to make the website really hard to test. Yeah, yeah so we're trying to grow our team. We're about to 10 or 12 in Chicago, another 15 or so in Palo Alto, a few others sprinkled around, but that's still quite a low ratio. So we are more advisors around test automation than um, actual implementers. I mean, it kind of varies for each person, but uh, ultimately we like to make that, ultimately we like to have a more uh, even keel, like. We compare on those things, um, but the sort of the line we draw in the sand is that we don't want any developer to write any test without our input, whether it's us help us, us helping write code or saying that's not what you should be testing. That's it's a really long answer to your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope it, but I hope we hit it. <laughs> yeah, I've got a question um, in the weeds a little bit. Do you have to write and maintain? five or six different step definition files, or do you have one step definition file that gets turned into some sort of metadata that then gets turned into good maintenance code. All right, I'll take this one. Uh, so <laughs> step definitions files, files in Cucumber, that's one of the biggest pain points, and they can get out of hand really, really fast. Uh, the biggest problem is uh, when your step definition file becomes six, 700 lines of just step definitions. So 
uh, we try to split them up as much as possible by uh, you know the all the step definitions that apply to a single feature or to a single uh, branch of the application. They go into a different folder, and then you split them up even further into smaller. Like the, these step definitions apply to the purchase page versus this is to the uh, the login page. So just having some sort of a rationality there really helps. Yeah, there's. <coughs> We do have some stuff in the comments folder that do, that does apply to more than one. Like you know, you can web, some web stuff and mobile stuff are the same. I mean, they might have different IDs or whatever to talk to, but the concept is the same. Now, API is kind of a diff, a separate thing. Yeah. We're trying to page object uh, as much as we can, but like a page object doesn't really theoretically make sense that well with an API. So I think we are struggling with that a little bit. Uh, there is it's this does not really. Um, like let you cut out a bunch of code. I mean, the code is still there. It's just uh, the benefit is more about uh, the presentation and the understanding. It's being a little bit more rational in the way it is. I believe you had a uh, question. Yeah. Um, so obviously, I think the uh, split that you've made between the test definition and the test implementation, if you've got a mix of web and native, makes a lot of sense, right? But I thought it was really interesting when you said that uh, Cucumber is kind of controversial. And as a, a, a developer, that really strikes a chord with me because on the one hand, I can see why it might be a very appealing tool, but it feels like dropping down into a toy language. Um, and I was just wondering if you could give any insight into what kind of discussion you might have had about alternative approaches or... Sure. So. Um uh, for those who didn't hear, the question is, uh, if, uh, in the debate of Cucumber versus not Cucumber, what, is the, what are the approaches to it? And um, uh, there was a couple of them. Um, we think the, uh, the line in the sand for us, we split up the, um, uh, the developers who really enjoy writing um, more unit tests, and um, they tend to use RSpec. And uh, we tend to go with Cucumber for more end-to-end um, -end or integration tests to hit multiple points. But, uh, one of our uh, developers actually, he uh, went out and he started uh, his own project. I'm not sure how it's doing, if he keeps up with it, but he calls it Cucumber Salad, where he basically takes the idea of Cucumber and RSpec and kind of take the pain points of both of them uh, and good point, uh, basically integrate it. So it is not as novelty language as, say, Cucumber by itself. So it's a bit of a mix between uh, RSpec and Cucumber. Yeah, I'd say. Um this is another thing that we kind of benefited from before we got there. Cucumber was already in place, and it, the reason it was put in place was a technical reason. I, I cannot recall what it was, but they, RSpec was not doing something that they wanted, wanted, so they brought in Cucumber. And so we didn't have to have that fight that I normally would have about this makes sense from a QA and just a behavioral uh, world. Um, I think the, the, the answer that I give to that question is um, it's really, it's, Cucumber's not great if you don't use it well. So we have this, for example, we have uh, one, of the, one of the fun things about Groupon is, uh, you know, if you go to, the, go to the site, there's really, you only see a little bit, but we have a massive back end for just our admin and our customer service and our salespeople that can, like, see deals and launch them and get them out to people. Uh, so in order to create a deal in our system, we have a page that, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's nuts. It's got like a hundred fields on it. Um, and someone, who will remain nameless because he still works there. Wrote a, wrote a uh, cucumber test that was literally like had a line for each field and that he was click type click, click type, type click and type and it ended up being three or four hundred lines long and so nobody nobody would want to uh, what's that yeah it was about three hundred lines for test and there were about ten tests in that file so it was a very large file so nobody would ever want to go and read that you so you don't get the benefit of cucumber from that um, it, it's another thing that we. Uh, as we try to staff more in, on the QA side, we can have a rational conversation, say, when feature requests do come in about how we want to test this. Uh, you know, we rely on, so the way we kind of spread the knowledge now is that I work with the tech leads of all of our teams. We've got probably 22-ish teams in Chicago, so I make sure that um, I have some tools that I've written that, you know, as we, we deploy quite a bit, usually at the minimum once a week, sometimes once a day. Once a day. Um, so I see what goes out. <laughs> Uh, I can see, okay, this is a test that, because I mean, tests have to go out with whatever we, we push. Uh, this is a test that could have been 
better done as a unit tester. Our spec. This we should have had a more behavioral example here because it's pretty important. We, so it's that's too late in the process to be to be honest. Like I'd rather not have to have this sort of check in place. But we have 350 some developers now. Uh, I would like to figure out a way to get that, that closer. So it's. It's a staffing issue partly and it's kind of education as well because some people just pick up Cucumber because, oh, that's what the stack is and we'll just write whatever's there. So we kind of have the problem you're talking about and the opposite one. So the people just start writing Cucumbers. They don't know what else they should be writing it in. And then it turns into these really ugly and awful and yeah. terrible to maintain. But it's again, it's Mac versus PC. It's the same thing. And if everybody could just realize, you know, just use the right tool for the job and take advantage of one. And there, there are definitely some, some great concerns. You know, I have some very powerful, um, interesting conversations with some of my developers about what they don't like about Cucumber. And I agree, because I, I, the last thing I want to do is make their lives harder. You know, I don't want, uh, I think somebody was talking about it yesterday, you know, when a test fails, not knowing where it was and, you know, what, was it a Selenium thing? Was it, a, you know, not, not having that sort of traceability. Uh, I, that, that, we feel that too, because I would rather um, we all sort of work in the same tool set. So we're kind of having this conversation where maybe we do bring that back a little bit. You know, we, so the people that we have who are writing these tests, looking at this test, are required to be technical. So maybe we, you know, are la we, we relax on the requirements for being, being uh, extremely readable, I guess. All right. So they, yeah, sorry. Were you going to say one more thing? Oh, no, no, no. All right. Uh, thank you, Dima and Jeff. Thank you. Next up, lunch. Uh, yes. See you back here at 135.